Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, and this is part three of our three part series on multiple personalities with Dr. Stephen Browdy, who is Professor Emeritus and former chairman of the philosophy department of the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. In addition, he is the editor of the Journal of Scientific Exploration and author of numerous books, including First Person plural, multiple personalities, and the philosophy of mind. His other books include Immortal Remains, The Limits of Influence, Crimes of Reason, and of course, The Gold Leaf Lady. Welcome again, Stephen. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. It's good to be with you once again. And I'm particularly excited about part three of our three-part series because we're going to delve into the paranormal. We've talked about, uh, in part one, uh, the basic definitions of, and history of multiple personalities. In part two, we began to look at the nature of human identity itself. And now, uh, I think it's important to uh, point out that uh, since virtually the very beginning, people have associated uh, paranormal phenomena with both hypnosis and, and I presume with multiple personality disorder. In fact, as we pointed out, the Society for Psychical Research, when it was founded in the uh, middle of the 19th century, began uh, by uh, raising that question. Yes, it looked like the phenomena both of hypnosis and of divided consciousness uh, promised uh, a distinctive angle on uh, understanding what's going on in cases of ESP. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also mentioned that uh, the very early mesmerists uh, thought that uh, uh, they used the term lucidity to Correct. describe certain states of consciousness induced by hypnosis that uh, seem to be uh, uh, involve clairvoyant abilities. Yes, it looked like when the early mesmerists um, magnetized or mesmerized their, their patients. Their patients uh, acquired the ability to diagnose illness in others, to predict future events, and so on. Mm -hmm. And now we know at this point in time that there are dozens of uh, experimental research studies and clinical observations suggesting that uh, the altered state of consciousness associated with hypnosis is what parapsychologists call psi-conducive. Um, I think it's very clear. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interested me as I got involved deeply in the community of um, mental health professionals studying multiple personality is that there hasn't been much research, a little bit, on the connection with multiple, between multiple personality and paranormal phenomena. Mm -hmm. It was much more likely for the clinicians themselves to confide in me when they knew about this other area of my research to tell me about various kinds of ostensibly psychic phenomena going on in sessions with their patients, something they didn't want to write about or even necessarily admit to uh, others in their community, but they felt safe at least in mm -hmm. getting it off their chest with me. So. Uh, I mean, it would seem that uh, to the extent that altered states of consciousness in general, uh, especially relaxed altered states and hypnotic altered states, uh, are psi conducive, that is conducive to extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, that uh, there might be a relationship that certain alters or alt personalities, subpersonalities, might have psychic gifts. Well, and that's what some clinical reports, at least confided to me, seem yeah. to suggest. Mm -hmm. It's not something about which I recall any papers being written. Okay. Um, but clinicians have often told me about um, their patients knowing things about them which they had mm -hmm. no normal way of knowing. Right. But you don't have to study multiple personality to get evidence of psi and the uh, psychoanalytic or psychotherapeutic right. situation. Jewel Eisenberg used to write about that quite a lot, and he was a hardcore Freudian. Well, the truth is that uh, a psychotherapeutic relationship is an intimate relationship, yes. and in general, uh, telepathic uh, 
connections seem to be associated with a, a wide variety of intimate relationships. It seems almost to invite it, yes. Yeah. Uh, but there, there's two ways to look at this. One is to say, well, do alters have special psychic gifts? And, and what you're saying is there's at least a suggestion of that. Uh, the rumors or stories told Wait, to let you me just other... interrupt there. Yeah. I'm not sure you'd want to say that the altars have psychic gifts. I think you might want to say that the altars allow the subject's psychic gifts to manifest in a way in which they might not ever have a chance before to manifest. Okay. In the same way that altars who display uh, linguistic abilities or artistic abilities never before shown by the subject mm -hmm. um, might really just show that these were latent in the person all along. Mm -hmm. Well, it might be that uh, the uh, base personality, uh, the normal personality, uh, doesn't believe that psychic abilities are possible. Sure. That personality might also uh, think that his or her artistic abilities mm -hmm. uh, don't exist. So. I mean, that's not at all uncommon, that people have gifts and, and they are taught or they learn as, as they grow up to believe that they don't have those gifts. Uh, yes. I mean, in that sense, education might um, work very well at snuffing out potential psychic superstars. And, and one of the things that we do know in parapsychology is that your belief system uh, correlates very strongly with your ability to will produce those phenomena in the laboratory. Yes, and so a lot of people think that hypnotic or dissociative states might allow us to bypass our normal resistances or inhibitions against demonstrating whether psychic abilities or other kinds of abilities. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can get people to do things in hypnotic states that they wouldn't be able to yeah. do uh, normally. A wide range of Yes, of some of them things. very funny. That's mm -hmm. what stage hypnotists make a living doing. Yeah. Well, I uh, had experience uh, early in my life as a college student. I hypnotized my roommate once and told him he was a cat. <laughs> and he just leapt up like five feet in the air and was on all fours and was kind of hissing at me until I told him he was no longer a cat. No fur balls, I presume. No. But it was extraordinarily dramatic. Yeah, and, I can imagine. Um, in fact, I just saw that person a few months ago, and he remembered the event after <laughs> after many decades. It, it still left an impression on sure. him. But so you have in the paranormal field uh, mediums and uh, trance channels who uh, go into an altered state of consciousness and express different personalities. Often, these entities aren't thought of as subpersonalities, but as external entities somehow, but uh, it seems very similar to multiple personality. Many of the presenting behaviors look very similar to what goes on when alters switch from one to another. Mm -hmm. um, and so that shows why it's not just an academic exercise to consider the relationship between multiple personality and the evidence for mediumship. Yeah. And it's why I felt I had to write my book first person plural before tackling the issue of uh, survival of bodily death and mm -hmm. immortal remains. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there are certainly some superficial similarities. The million dollar question is whether they're more than superficial. Yeah. Well, to start out with, I think it's fair to say that uh, because you're a trans channel or a trans medium and you can uh, exhibit multiple entities, I'll call them, uh, coming through you, very much akin to the uh, multiple personalities uh, experience in dissociative identity disorder, it doesn't mean that you uh, have a pathology. It certainly doesn't mean that. And also, one major difference between what you see in most cases of mediumship or trans channeling and cases of multiple personality is in multiple personality, there's a kind of obvious adaptational um, component to the, the altar, which, you, mm -hmm. which might be very obvious or at least something you can figure out yeah. with a little bit of detective work. Um, in the case of trans channels and mediums, um, or especially mediums, mm -hmm. um, the communicating entities seem more related to the needs of someone other than the medium. They mm -hmm. don't seem to have the same kind of dynamic relevance to the medium mm -hmm. that alters have to the multiple. Mm -hmm. More related to the needs of the sitters at a seance, yes. for example. Yes. Except in drop-in cases.
uh, let's say, define a drop-in case. A drop-in case is where, during a seance, uh, a communicator comes through, not only unknown to anybody at the seance, but uninvited. Mm -hmm. Someone uh, or a communicator, apparently with his or her own agenda, some issues that need to be worked out. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I suppose it's fair to say uh, right now that uh, we have uh, over a hundred years of history and many, many dozens of uh, documented clinical reports of multiple personality disorder. Yes. And over the same period of time, or even a slightly longer period of time, we have hundreds of cases of mediumistic seances that have been observed uh, by researchers and, and reported on. So we have a big database of, of both. The database is even larger in a way than you have indicated because um, prior to the di prior to the discoveries of Puisegur and others about a second level of consciousness, um, cases that might now be diagnosed as multiple personality might have been diagnosed formally as demonic possession. Mm -hmm. um, but times have changed. The overall gestalt has changed. We now have evidence from the history of hypnosis of multiple levels of consciousness. Yep. And so um, some people have suggested that whether it's demonic possession or multiple personality, you're really dealing with the same kind of underlying dissociative process. Mm -hmm. All that's changed is the symptom language or the idiom of distress into something that's culturally appropriate. And the social context. Yes, exactly. However, uh, one of the main researchers in the area of um, dissociative disorders, uh, psychiatrist Colin Ross, mm -hmm. has also studied people who report psychic phenomenon yes. commonly. And as I recall, he, he claims that one commonality between people who report lots of psychic phenomenon in their lives and multiples uh, is uh, childhood trauma. Colin is an exception in many ways. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, first of all, not afraid to even raise the specter of psychic phenomena, and yeah. I certainly give him credit for that. Mm -hmm. And I take his clinical observations very seriously. Mm -hmm. So that, that might be a, a common element, that uh, both uh, multiple personalities and an openness to uh, what we can't claim that these are genuine parapsychological phenomena because these just are self-reports of, of people, but uh, people who believe that they experience a lot of paranormal activity both report uh, a higher degree than normal uh, of childhood trauma. Well, I mean, multiples exhibit uh, apparently a higher degree of childhood trauma than the general population. Yeah. and. So there are several converging lines of evidence, those mm -hmm. that Colin has supplied, and even that informal line of evidence from the clinicians who've confided in, to me about uh, the spontaneous occurrences of apparent psychic functioning mm -hmm. in their sessions with their patients. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be inclined to think that uh, childhood trauma it, it might be like taking a very strong drug. It's going to blow away a lot of the crust of social conditioning that, that we have and people are going to look for uh, alternatives to, to deal with uh, the stress that they're under. And those alternatives may involve a, a form of escapism into a dissociative identity, or it might inv involve if, if uh, alternative realities of a psychic nature exist, opening up to them. Well, it would be an analog, I think, to those people who've reported uh, the discovery of psychic abilities in themselves after a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. So another kind of major life trauma that might have the same effect of blowing away all sorts of former inhibitions against mm -hmm. accessing various parts of our psyche. Yeah. Uh, another thing uh, about the relationship between uh, the concept of identity and the concept of psychic uh, experience is that uh, most of us raised in, uh, particularly here in the United States, particularly in North America, let us say, uh, are conditioned to uh, believe that uh, psychic functioning, telepathy, and ESP are, are not possible. I, I think it, 
gen generally the case. I grew up in the Midwest. That was certainly the way I grew up. It's, it was the way I grew up. In spite of having some religious background. It's just these things are not possible. I, that's how I started my investigation. And many parapsychologists today start out as skeptics. Yeah, me too. Wondering, wondering uh, how is it that considering these phenomena are impossible, anyone believes otherwise. And uh, one strategy um, that has been hypothesized is known as the psychic support figure. Since I, my little skin encapsulated ego, can't possibly induce psychic functioning, maybe Archon from planet Xerxes or, or, or some other entity that is not me could because they they have a more exotic background. I, I might it might be easier for me to accept that some subpersonality or some other part of my subconscious that I give a different name to could be uh, function psychically rather than than me. Well, this raises I think an issue that you and I have discussed on many occasions and that is the fear of psychic functioning. Mm -hmm. um, because if we think that we really do have the ability to peek into other people's minds or to read the future, um, it suggests a level of omniscience that um, we might find just overwhelmingly uh, intimidating. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, the way I like to put it is that Freud, uh, I don't consider myself a Freudian, but I thought he had at least one very good insight, probably many more than one, and, and that is that we don't want to know what's in our own subconscious mind. We, all of the Freudian defense mechanisms, which I think are pretty well documented, show the various strategies we go through to avoid uh, confronting our own yes. thoughts and feelings. Well, you might remember an old Twilight Zone episode of a person who flipped a coin, it landed on its side, and for the entire day when the coin stayed on his side, this person was able to hear the thoughts of all the people around him, and his life suddenly became a living hell. He heard things mm -hmm. he didn't want to know about, mm -hmm. and eventually he was relieved when the, the coin fell over, and that access to the thoughts of others was cut off. So we don't want to know our thoughts, and you're suggesting we don't want to know others. Ahead others, of. and we certainly don't want other people to know our thoughts if if right. we don't want to know them ourselves. Right, right. So, so there's a lot of fear around psychic functioning, and I think every parapsychologist has their war stories about uh, the the persecution that comes from the outside, the uh, hostility and ridicule. That well, that's just another level of fear, yes, yeah. of condemnation. In, yes. Indeed it is, but uh, I often think that, uh, and maybe I'm getting a bit off topic here, but uh, it seems as if uh, Socially, in the 20th, since the middle of the 20th century, we've had uh, racial liberation and we've had uh, <laughs> the feminist movement and the gay liberation movement. What we haven't yet had is, uh, is a parapsychological or psychic liberation movement. I wonder if we'll live to see that. <laughs> Well, I, I'd like to think so, but I'm, I'm not holding my breath. No, the trend doesn't suggest it's going in that direction. No, it, it's deep. It's very deep yes. because we used to burn witches at the stake in, in this country, in, here in North America. So uh, there's an enormous fear of, of, of that sort of thing. But anyhow, getting back to uh, the relationship between multiple personalities and, and mediumship, where, where do you come down on that? It's hard to know where to come down. I would say that although the similarities between the two are sometimes quite suggestive, no. um, I don't think we're entitled to conclude that mediumship is nothing but a form of uh, dissociation mm -hmm. uh, because there are too many cases where mediums give information known to um, no one present at a seance, uh, later verified, and which strongly suggest uh, the persistence of some kind of consciousness following bodily death and dissolution. Mm -hmm. You don't see that in typical cases of, or any real cases I'm aware of, of um, multiple personality. Okay. So there is that difference. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what people are really wondering about when they wonder about the comparison between multiple personality and, uh, and mediumship. Mm -hmm. 
So that doesn't mean that all cases of ostensible communicators are what they purport to be. And in particular, when you look at so-called control personalities in cases of mediumship, these quite clearly seem to be constructs of the medium. Control personalities are communicators who act sort of like masters of ceremony yes. to the spirit world. Their mm -hmm. job is to introduce a uh, succession of communicators uh, communicating through the medium, sort of like the Ed McMahons of the mm -hmm. uh, spirit world. And those quite clearly seem to be um, constructed by the medium. They're mm -hmm. um, transparently artificial. Mm -hmm. Now, if they are artificial, then I think we have to uh, be open to the possibility that others are also, but more subtly, artificial. Mm -hmm. We can't rule that out. Well, William James uh, looked at this question, as I recall. He became convinced that uh, his deceased colleague, Richard Hodgson, was appearing as a communicator through the medium, Mrs. Piper. Well, that's not my understanding of James. Uh -huh. He, My understanding of James is that he was convinced that Mrs. Piper exhibited paranormal phenomena, but he was not ready to come down on there being evidence of survival in her case. Uh, all right. Well, um, we'll have to keep that as an open question for, okay. for the moment. I thought James at one point said he was actually convinced it was Hodgson, but... This will send us back to our books. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point I really want to get at here is, uh, let's just assume for the moment that that's the case. It may not be. Um, James argued that what was going on, if it were true, is that there were two wills involved, the will of the medium to, uh, the word he used is personate, mm -hmm. the will to personate the deceased party, and then a will on the other side, for, uh, 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 you know, the deceased entity, Hodgson in this case, hypothetically, uh, to be personated, that it somehow would require a joint activity. Well, gee, the evidence for survival is so hard to interpret. I mean, yeah. depending on what kind of assumptions we're willing to make, um, it's not even clear what we would expect the evidence for survival in cases of mediumship to look like. Mm -hmm. We have to make assumptions about how easy it would be for a deceased individual to communicate, right. um, whether the person even wants to communicate, mm -hmm. um, how much of their consciousness even uh, is able to communicate after right. bodily death. Yeah. And James, among others, suggested that communicators often seem to be in a dreamy state, like they're not fully there. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's because in their post-mortem state, they're not fully there. Yeah. So I don't think, we, we, I think we have to be very careful in interpreting these kinds of phenomena yeah. because um, the survival hypothesis, the hypothesis mm -hmm. that um, people can survive after bodily death and communicate via mediums. Um, it's not clear what the evidence should even look like unless we're willing to introduce a whole bunch of assumptions which are not independently verifiable mm -hmm. and which are extremely controversial. Oh, oh, all right, and I think it's fair to let our viewers know that you've explored this extensively, particularly in your book, Immortal Remains. Uh, in the future, I you know, hope to uh, do some uh, more interviews with you on, I'll hold you to that. On, on that subject, but that basically where you come down is is that the evidence for survival is far from conclusive and, and that you are inclined to think, if, if I'm correct, that the evidence for what is sometimes called super ESP outweighs the evidence for survival. I'd say it's a toss-up. It depends on what day you ask me. Uh -huh. um, I think for reasons I mentioned in Immortal Remains, there are some real problems for the living agent psi or super ESP uh, explanation of cases of survival. Mm -hmm. Some have a kind of tug to them that uh, is very difficult to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And actually the uh, explanatory terrain here is much more complicated than we're suggesting in this little uh, brief exchange. Obviously, this is these are issues that philosophers have been pondering for Century for over a century. Yes, for over a century. So uh, we can't hope to solve them in the context of a half-hour uh, video interview. What I'm willing to say is that it's certainly not a slam dunk in favor of either survival or the living agent's psychic okay. functioning alternative. Oh, all right, I'm, uh, that's clear. It's perfectly okay to kind of uh, keep it ambiguous. 
I think the point that we want to make now, however, is it, at least that uh, when evaluating mediumship or channeling, it's useful to keep in mind the uh, considerable database that exists in the field of multiple personalities because uh, they each seem to, in their own way, shed light on the other. Yes, it's absolutely important to keep in mind that in cases of multiple personality disorder or even less pathological forms of dissociation, um, people have the ability to create very impressive alternate personae um, even when there's not evidence of survival. Mm -hmm. And there are some very interesting cases of channeling or mediumship that are very impressive as psychic achievements or psychological achievements, but not at all impressive as cases of survival. One mm -hmm. good example would be uh, so called the medium Helene Smith, studied by Theodore Flournoy, yes. uh, who wrote a book called From India to the Planet Mars. Mm -hmm. Helene Smith, the medium, um, claimed to be receiving messages from residents of Mars, yes. and she invented a very elaborate and thoroughly consistent uh, Martian language, both written and spoken, which after analysis turned out to be modeled very closely on her native French language. Mm -hmm. But it was clearly a creative tour de force on her part to do this. Mm -hmm. And if we don't take that kind of thing seriously, then I think it's going to be all too easy to overestimate the achievements of mediums in a, a more survival-related context. And, and I suppose a whole other aspect uh, to this is the question of creativity. I often think that uh, in the parapsychological domain, there are individuals who are frustrated novelists. <laughs> That, that many many of them might uh, be quite gifted at uh, creating very elaborate stories if, if they had chose to channel their creative energies a little differently. And we should also keep in mind how dissociation, hypnosis, or otherwise um, leads to or can unleash various kinds of creative abilities not otherwise mm -hmm. demonstrable. Yeah, we haven't even touched on that. It's such a rich topic. Yes. Well, Stephen Browdy, thank you so much for sharing this half hour and the previous two half hours with me. It's been enlightening. Thank you. It's been fun. And thank you for being with us.